Two weeks ago, I put out a video that I titled Building a Better Backend. And in that video, I built this. This right here is the first little iteration of this sort of template that I wanted to put together, which the whole idea behind this is to make a template for Go apps where you could just eventually run, create something app, and it'll just spit out a really nice, well-structured Go app for you so that beginners and experts alike will have an easy way to get these apps structured. Because I love Go, I love building Go backends, but one of the things I've noticed is that it really sucks getting these things put together. Getting all of the things put in place and figuring out how you want to actually manage these projects, it really sucks to do, so I wanted to try and fix that. And this was my first iteration, but it was rightfully, but a lot of you rightfully pointed out that there are a lot of flaws with this. And to be completely honest with you, this is basically just an express app written in Go and it's just a more performant express app. It's all it is. I'm not really leveraging all the features of Go and I'm not really doing things in, I, this project wasn't really using Go the way a lot of people like to use Go and it wasn't leveraging a lot of the unique features that the language has and it wasn't, it could have been a lot better is the point. So today I wanna to show you the way I decided to make that better. And I wanna introduce to you the Tapir app. So first and foremost, you're gonna ask why in God's name did you name this the Tapir app? What is wrong with you? What is a Tapir? Now, this has a little bit of a personal story here. So way back when, about a year-ish ago, my friends and I were trying to figure out what, uh, we wanted to start a little SaaS company. We wanted to make a wanted to make some apps because we knew how to write code and we wanted to do something with it. Uh, and le looking back, it's laughable. I didn't know anything, but then again, when I look back a year from now, hopefully I will think that I know nothing now. So it's all about growing. But the point is we wanted to make an app and that app ended up being called Tapir. It is the whole idea of behind it was to, um, it was basically just Swagger. If you've ever used like Swagger's API documentation, we wanted something like that. Cause I hated trying to like document APIs in Google docs. And I hadn't learned about this yet. So I was like, oh, I'll just build it. And it was a Google search away, but it's neither here nor there. And we named it that, but you know, that obviously never went anywhere. Cause it's a silly idea. It already exists, but I wanted to sort of memorialize the name. So I ended up calling this the Tapir app. Eventually there will be a package called create Tapir app. And the whole point of that is going to be to allow you to quickly scaffold a Golang backend that could be a cron app, a GraphQL app, an HTTP app, whatever you want it to be, it'll scaffold it for you. And I'll get more into that later. But for now, let me show you this little template I put together and then we'll talk about the future. So up here, this is all open source, totally public, MIT. Use this however much you want. And if there is anything in here you disagree with, design choices, um, code, whatever it is, please tell me. I want feedback and I wanna do this right for you guys. I want this to be something that is useful for everybody, beginners and experts alike. So if you have pull requests, if you have ideas, feedback, please tell me, I will implement them. I have, hopefully this shows you, I have, I am not, a master of anything. I am learning just as much as you are. I want to make this good. So uh, tell me what you think. And with that sort of disclaimer out of the way, the structure of this project is very different. I have it open right here. And when you download this, you will get a fully structured app that has um, basic parts of CRUD implemented on the like a to do app type thing. I didn't implement updating and deleting because it's trivial to do. And I've been working on this for like seven hours trying to make sure that everything's polished and good. So I kind of just got lazy and didn't finish it. Maybe I'll do that later. But right now, all I have is you can just go ahead and do a task dev and this will spin up the server with hot reloading because I'm using air. And if we go over here to this, uh, I actually have it in production right now. Again, we'll talk about that later. HTTP colon slash slash local post uh, 80, 80 slash to do's and we can get, and this is going to be running out of a local MongoDB instance. And then I can post to create a new one. I'll hit that hit get, and then get this back. So nothing crazy implemented, but it does have all this in here. And if I wanted to actually look at the docs and it'll give me my documentation. So I have all the Swagger documentation set up. Uh, the features of this that I just off the top of my head, we have Swagger implemented, we have REST implemented, we have um, hot reloading with air, we have task file for building and running and deploying all this stuff. Docker is pre-configured and set up. I have the Docker file pre-configured ready. If you want to deploy this to railway, it is insanely trivial. All you have to do is just hit the deploy button and it'll just work a video on that that I put out yesterday super easy all that is set up and ready for you and then so I have this uh, Viper Viper is what's going to be loading in all of our environment variables because we can do some validation on it and again this really nice structure and all that stuff so we have a bunch of new stuff in here so with all that out of the way let me tour this sort of project with you so first things first is I have laid out the 
pre I have laid everything out in a very different way. So I'm utilizing the structure of CMD, PKG, and internal directories. And the reason why I did this is because this is something that was recommended. I did a bunch of research on how a lot of Go packages are formatted. And this is, there is no official way that the Go developers have said like, yes, this is how you should structure your projects. This is how you should lay out your folders. That hasn't been said, but I've seen this in a lot of places and a lot of people who seem to know what they're talking about agree with this. And the more I've used it, the more I'm like, yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense. And especially with the whole goals behind the stack, I mean, goals behind this app, it makes a lot of sense. It's very modular and makes it very easy to actually use things. First and foremost, we have the CMD directory. And what is the CMD directory? That is where your executables are going to live. That is where the things that you can actually do go run X. That's where those are going to live. If you want to build an HTTP server, you're going to build it within the CMD directory. Then the internal directory is going to have all of the logic and functions and packages or whatever that is internal to your app. So these are things that should only be used by this app. And then the PKG directory is where if you're like building a library or something, say we wanted to in within the Tapir app, we wanted to add a CLI app to this, or we wanted to add not a CLI app, sorry, that would go in CMD. But if we wanted to add something like uh, if we wanted to be able to import this and upload, like we have github.com slash SPF 13 Viper, if we wanted to do that with the Tapir app that you would put that stuff in package. I only have one thing in here and that's just for graceful shutdown, but we'll talk about that later. That's the sort of package structure we've got right there. And then getting into the CMD directory, I'm not not going to go super in depth on everything in here. There will be very detailed tutorials on this in the future. This is very much just sort of an introduction breakdown, and then you guys should just go through this on your own. But I'll give you the high level uh, overview of this. So when you go in here, we have our func main. This is what's obviously executed. This is the main thing for our HTTP server. We have this title up here. So this is stuff for the swagger. Then there's some weird stuff I'm doing in here, and I'll explain why I'm doing that. And what I'm going to be doing in here is I have this first thing I have is this setup for an exit code for exiting my app. So whenever you terminate an app, it will throw some exit code. If it throws zero, then there's no issue. If it throws one, then there was an error, whatever you want to do. So what I'm doing in here, I'm setting an exit code, which will default to zero because variables are initialized. So there's zero valuables values when you do this var thing. So then what I'm going to do down here is anytime I have an error, I'll set the exit code to one, print out that error and return. And the reason why I'm returning and I'm not just panicking is because we have graceful shutdown implemented here. So the whole point of a graceful shutdown is that we want to make sure that if something goes wrong and we have to close our app, we want to make sure, or we're just like closing our app and terminating a container and then uploading a new one. We want to make sure that all the current requests can continue. And we don't have like maybe a user's in the middle of checking out some product and they're halfway through the request. I don't want them to get unlucky because maintenance happened or a server crash or whatever, and they just get axed right there. And then halfway through it breaks, it's going to cause a ton of issues. So what a graceful shutdown will do is it'll make sure that everything terminates correctly, make sure that all the requests go through, and then it'll make Make sure that our database is um, closed correctly and all that stuff happens and the way I'm accomplishing that is first of all I have this little shutdown gracefully function here all this is doing uh, what's the best way to explain this for closing quits so to close the channel yeah so what I have in here is I have a buffer channel, which is going to close. It's going to close the channel when this method terminates. And then what I'm going to do is it's going to wait. It's going to do signal not notify. So it'll notify this signal anytime I have system call of sig init or sig term, which is basically the app stops. Uh, if you do control C, that's going to interrupt the app. And then once that happens, that will pass that value into quit. And then that'll get read out of here. And if you remember anything about channels, channels will block. So the execution will be blocked right here. So that means that within my main.go, we're actually just going to be sitting here blocked on the main thread. And then we spin up a, another go routine, which is actually where our server is going to live. Our server is going to live on a go routine. So within here we have uh, our config. So we set up our config. We get this cleanup function out of our run. And if we go down into run, which will then be deferred running here. So then whenever, that channel gets unblocked this uh, method will return or if we return here with our status code of one that'll stop our app but if we have the shutdown gracefully so where we get that interrupt this will actually terminate the this will terminate the execution of this main function which will go ahead and call all of our deferred functions which in this case we have cleanup and um yeah, I think that's it. So yeah, so we have cleanup and then os.exit with our exit code. Then we go down here to our run function. And within our run function, what we're doing is we have an app cleanup and error coming out of our build server. So the reason why I have this build this uh, cleanup function is because we need I need a way to disconnect from the MongoDB instance that I'm going to build up within the storage. So I have this um, I'm using this pattern where you declare like any of your like storage things as storage so like database object storage or whatever. Again, none of this is really like well-defined in there's no like 
hard set way to do all of this, but this is sort of just how I've been organizing things. You sort of just organize them into the, into just things that make sense together into sort of domains that work together. It's not full domain driven design type stuff. I don't, eh, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but this is more just like organizing things together where within my internal here, I have my to-do folder. And then within the to-do folder, we have a controller, we have storage, we have a router, we have all that stuff. I'll show you that in a moment. But basically what we're going to do is we have this cleanup function down here, which is going to get created, which all it's going to do is just close our MongoDB instance. And there is a lot to digest and process here. There's a lot that goes into this and a lot of scaffolding I've done here especially if you're new take some time and try and go through this if you really want to learn how like go works because this will give you a much better understanding of more than just like an http server but also give you an understanding of go because this is sort of how this seems well this is sort of how like a lot of go things are structured with these um where we're effectively creating these controllers and all this stuff, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So within here, we go ahead and we build our server and then we listen in a Go routine. And the reason why we're listening on a Go routine is because we need to be able to gracefully shut down here because the main thread will keep our threat, our whole program running, but then we spin up this Go routine for our actual server. Then we pass out the cleanup and the app shutdown. And the way you gracefully shut down a fiber app is with this app dot shutdown um, command. So this will close um, this will shut down the server without in interrupting any active connections. So this is super important. We need to make sure that we do that. So we pass that in there and then we go ahead and run all this stuff. Then finally down here within this build server, this is where the actual bootstrapping is going to happen. So I have this method I declared called bootstrap Mongo, and this will just create my MongoDB instance, the ENV that we're passing down here over and over again, that that's coming from Viper. It's loading our Viper config. I have my MongoDB URI, MongoDB name. I'm saying this is actually going to be a timeout. So I'm passing in a timeout of 10 seconds because if we look at this uh, function itself, I have in here, I have this context at with timeout, which means that this is going to, um, this will just uh, throw an error after 10 seconds of uh, after 10 seconds of not doing anything. So I have that in here. I'm actually just connecting to my database. Nothing too crazy. Then we go back into our main here. I'm creating my fiber app. I'm adding my middleware. So you put your middlewares in here, have a little health check in here, which is just something I like to have Add our documentation, the swagger handler default. Then we can actually add our domains of whatever we want to add to our project. So in this case, I'm adding the to do's here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create this to do store. So what is this to do store? This is going to be what exists within this file right here. So I have this uh, struct declared up here and this is just the to do storage struct, which all it's going to have is just uh, one variable within the struct, which is going to be the DB, which is a pointer to a Mongo database instance on the surface. This seems kind of dumb. Why am I doing this? And the reason why I'm doing this is because I can now attach all of the methods I need that are going to mess with the database to this struct. So Golang struct methods allow us to organize all this stuff in a really clean way to where I have this new to do storage thing, which will just create a new to do storage instance. So I pass in the database, it'll set the pointer equal to this. And then I have all these methods in here. So I have this create create to do method. I have this get all to do's method. This isn't about what actually happens in here, but that's what these methods do. And then I have all of the information I need for my database. So instead of having like a models directory or whatever, I can just have all the structs I need for how the database is, uh, how this stuff is stored in the database right here. And that's also one of the advantages of having a document based database is I can just put all this stuff in here and it just works. We don't have to worry about migrations or pushing a schema or whatever. Um, really document databases are really growing on me. That's another topic for another day, but the more I use them and the more I really get into them at an even deeper level than I was before, I, I, I really like them. So we have that in here. We have our storage uh, method. Then we have um, going back to main, we have this controller. So we have to set up this controller and this controller is what's going to contain all the handlers for our roots. Um, a lot of people said that it's very ambiguous to just call it a handler. And I actually do kind of agree. So instead of having like handlers.go, we have controller.go because handlers could be anything. It could be a gRPC handler. It could be an R RPC handler. It could be a rest handler. It can be whatever. So we set this to be a controller and I mean, semantic. So we have this in here so i set up my to-do controller and i'm going to be passing in this storage which is a pointer to the to-do storage so you remember we just made that to-do storage now on all of these different methods all these controller methods i'm creating in here i'll have access to my database so we do all this we create our new to-do controller and then i'm setting my um these uh last time i called these eto a lot of people were mad about that so we switched that to request and response i do agree so we switched all of that over we go ahead and here we have our swagger uh documentation in here then for this actual controller i'm passing in the to-do controller and then on here i can go ahead and fetch stuff out of the storage so instead of interfacing directly with our database in the actual controller we're going to do that within the storage file so we can split those up 
And it's a nice, much cleaner way of doing this because A, we can reuse those storage methods if we just create like a get all to do's method and then have like a set, a, like an offset and a skip and all this stuff. We had this was a real app. You can put all that stuff in there and it makes it really easy to deal with this in the future. So we have all that. You can do that stuff in here, this t.storage create to do. And then we send all this stuff down. Same thing for the um, get all to do's. It's just get all to do's right here. Very simple stuff. And then finally, once we have all this stuff made, we can actually add these routes to our app. So I just pass in the app and the to-do controller. And then I go into my router file right here. You can add some extra middlewares just for the to-dos group, um, like authentication or something if you wanted to. And then once all of that is done, we can go ahead and add the post and the get requ the post request and the get request. And we're all set. All of our stuff is put together. Now you might be thinking, this seems like a lot of boilerplate and a lot of nonsense for all of this. And to an extent, I sort of agree. But one of the things that you need to remember here is one of the big issues that was in the original version of this was I had global variables that we were just calling from all different places. So I had like a database package or whatever, or a MongoDB package, which would expose the database instance itself. And I would just call that from all these different functions. Now, that doesn't happen anymore. There's no global variables that we're calling for out of packages. We're calling it out of stuff that's added to these actual structs and we're creating all of these in a very intentional way. So everything is scoped correctly and cleaned up really nicely. And it just, I think actually intuitively, this makes a ton of sense for actually writing APIs and stuff like that because we have our controller in here. So I need to create the controller which is gonna handle the user input will come in here. And then we create the storage route which will actually do something on it. Or if we had to create some more stuff in here, maybe Maybe we had another storage, like we had bucket storage or something, then we could work with that in there or whatever we want to do. All these different things, when we organize it like this, it gets really easy to sort of, it's really easy to actually just manage all of this stuff, if that makes any sense. It's really hard to explain, and I think you kind of just need to develop with it for a while, and I think that's something that um, as that happens, I'll be able to make more succinct breakdowns on that. But this is sort of a new way of organizing this, and I think it's a better way. It's the very much the go way of doing things. So we have all this here. We have our router, we have all this stuff put together and our app is ready. So as you can see down here, it's running, it's working. All that stuff is put together. That was a very high level look at all this stuff. There's more to it than that, but those are the key pieces. Those are the key things that you're gonna get here. And with all that said, what is the future of this? What is the whole point that I'm trying to do with this? And the answer to that is pretty simple. I want to turn this into effectively a CLI app where you can easily and quickly create hyper modular Go backends because it's one of those things where setting up Go projects I found is really annoying. And granted, I set them up more than most people do because I have to do these videos and stuff. So I have to constantly make new projects, but getting all this stuff put together in a decent way and just figuring out how to do it. Like when I was learning how to do use fiber and learning how to use echo and all these different frameworks it was really really obnoxious to try and figure out how these projects should be laid out and where everything should go because there are no opinions on this and this opinion that i put forward here and i obviously there's going to be stuff that people disagree with there are some things i'll stick to there's some things that i'll definitely disagree with your disagreements on and all that stuff it's meant to be a collaborative process if there's issues again tell me but there's no there was no way to do it before so i was just kind of left to try and figure out how to do this and it was kind of a pain so you can have this built-in structure where you could just run create to peer app and then once you have that run you can go through and you can pick okay I want fiber for my I want fiber for my um, rest framework I want mongodb for my database I want these extra features and you just click generate and then that will generate and scaffold the app for you and if you remember how it actually works the project is laid out in a really nice way to where it'll be really easy to do that it'll be really easy to have that dynamically generate because I could even just have multiple things generate. If you want a GraphQL server and an HTTP server, you can generate both of those super easily. And that's another thing that's super nice about how modular this is, is I'm actually working on moving Insider Viz into this uh, format because I could, it, this is basically a mono repo. You can have all of your different, you can put all of your logic and stuff in like well-defined broken down pieces in the, in the like, uh, internal directory and then within main you can just create new executables so if i need a cron job that cron job can consume different parts of it can 
consume different storages or whatever and then the HTTP can consume different storages and controllers or whatever and all these different things can work together in this really nice way and you can just build these amazing backends that can be hosted in different places and do all this different stuff insanely easily so that's where this is sort of hopefully going to go I'm going to be working on building out that I don't know how long that's going to take or how hard that's going to be but definitely we'll be working on that it'll be totally open sourced and then I think long term I want to actually do like a full project with this and actually show you all this in production because it's one thing to show you a to-do app but it's another thing to show you a real app that's actually running and the reason why i constantly reference my own real app of insider viz is because you will learn more from actually doing something and actually building something that's non-trivial because things get crazy when you're in the real world so i want to illustrate that and i want to do a series on that and i think what i'm going to do is i think Practical skills is that project that I sort of started and messed around with uh, two weeks ago or something alive. And I think I'm going to bring pick that back up and I'm going to build it using this stack for the back end and then probably just use Next.js for the front end. Um, I think it just makes the most sense. I was thinking about using Astro for the front end, but it really doesn't really fit that scheme as well because... Um, there's a couple things that it doesn't have that I kind of want and Next.js just has the features built into it that I just need uh, that makes my life super easy. So I'm probably going to do that. And effectively what I want to create is just a super strong tutorial and video backlog series on how all this stuff works, how to use this stack to build real stuff with actual examples. Cause I think that's lacking in the go world. So I want to build all of that. That is the goal. Um, we'll see how all that goes. It's a pretty ambitious project, but I think it'll be worth it if we can put that together. And uh, I think that's about it. Uh, if you made it this far, super appreciative as always. And hopefully this looks good to you. Give me your feedback and I'll talk to you soon.